everybody. Welcome back. It's Mob Vlog. Adam Flowers here. We're in for one hell of a show, guys. Strap in, get ready, because this is going to be one great show. Today we have Joe Collada. Normally on this show, we joke a little, but today we're going to joke a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Red Wamet, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. All right. For those of you that don't know Joe Collada, Joe is Frank Collada's uh, younger brother. He was a barber in Chicago, and he worked at Igor's Barber Shop. Joe, a lot of uh, different guys came in and out, but I wanted to start by asking you about the time that you met Lefty Rosenthal. Okay. Lefty, Tony always came to our shop before he moved to Vegas. And then when he moved to Vegas, he would come to our salon or barber shop, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the first time I met Lefty, he, Tony brought him into the shop. He said, Joe, this is my friend Frank. It was probably like 1973 or four. I'm not exactly sure. He's just my friend Frank. He says, uh, give him a haircut. I said, okay. I took the blow dryer. I blow the hair off the chair. I said, okay, you could sit down. He goes, and I want you to take a wet towel, a damp towel, wipe the chair, then take a dry towel and wipe the chair. I look at the guy like he's nuts. I blew the hair off. I says, I blew all the hair off. You could sit down. He says, take a damp towel, wipe the chair, take a dry towel. I'm thinking, who is this guy? I didn't know who he was. Tony goes, Joe, do me a favor. Wipe the chair like he asked you. I said, okay. So I wiped the chair. So he really was that anal lefty. So he sits in the chair. I cut his hair. Nice man, gave him a haircut. And I think I cut his hair maybe two more times when he'd come to town with Tony. But Tony used to come there. His brothers used to come there. We've got a picture of a food plate. Oh, yeah, it's the, blue, the, the blueberry muffin. The blueberry oh, muffin. Yeah. That's, yeah. I was just throwing that, throwing oh. that up, Lefty. Sorry. You know, I don't know if he had 12 blueberries on each side, but he, I did hear that he wanted. Even like close to even, that's how he was. But when I cut his hair, he was a gentleman, and he was a five dollar tip even back then. And uh, yeah, I had to wipe the chair, damp towel, dry towel, sit down. And I always tell my customers that whenever they would come in, like all the like kids that were infatuated with all the gangster stuff, I would tell them stuff about it, Lefty, and they'd always when they'd come in, they joke with me. Take a dry wet towel, a dry towel. So that was the story. Hey, so growing up in that area and having all those guys around, you ran into uh, Joe Lombardo a few oh. times. Was he was he really a funny guy? Do you there was a, you... Joe was a, a jokester. You know, he was a jokester. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was always a, when he first came in the first time. When Tony brought him in, Igor knew who Joe Lombardo was. I always thought my brother was their equal, but he wasn't. But at that time, I did think that, you know. So he comes in, and uh, my boss, Igor, is like, let me help you with your coat, Joe. And he's taking his coat off and taking uh, – he had a cap on, you know. And, and Igor says, don't charge him. And Joe goes, no, charge me. He goes, because you're not going to give me a $10 haircut and come back and ask for a $3,000 favor. He goes, I pay wherever I go, which was true. He did. <laughs> I started cutting Joe's hair then, and, and I cut his brother, one of his brother's hair. I got along real good with him, Rocky. Cut his hair for 30-something years. Rocky was a nice guy. So Joe comes in one day, and he's got he, – they had a uh, Western messenger service down the street. It was uh, like a book joint. You know, guys would play cards in there, and they could bet horses. They were supposed to call in the bets or bring the bets to the track, but they booked them themselves there. And Joe would get there early in the morning and take the money from the night before 
because they'd have card games. They'd have like, my friend Ricky was a dealer there. They'd have like six or eight tables going to poker, sometimes all weekend long, you know. So he comes in and he's got this beat up jacket. Joe never was flashy. Comes in with this beat up jacket on. And my wife had just bought me a new jacket and I had it hanging on the hook in my room. We had individual rooms. So Joe goes, hey, that's a nice jacket you got there, Joey. I go, yeah, thanks. My wife bought it for me. He goes, want to trade me that jacket for this jacket? I go, no way. It was a gift for my wife. Takes his jacket. He lays it on my barber chair and zips the lining. $40,000. I says, I'll trade you. I'll trade you. He goes, too late. You were asked once, too late. He goes, there are no trade now. Why was I sorry? My wife understood if I had to trade it for that jacket for forty thousand. <laughs> well, what, 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 what was the what was the address at Igor's barber shop? Michael Graham's asking. Okay, it, it's spelled uh, E G O R S, and it was on uh, sixty. First barber shop was sixty nineteen, then we moved down the street to sixty thirty five West Belmont. It was about a half a block. West of Austin Avenue on Belmont, on the south side of the street. Um, all right, Big Tuna. Hey, Joe, what outfit guys were the best tippers? They were all decent tippers. They were all five dollars, no more than uh, no more than five dollars. Truck drivers were just as good as they were. They never flashed. Christmas time, they were good. They give you a 50 or a hundred at Christmas, you know, but uh, yeah. they were all fine. Just standard $5. Yeah. They didn't flash like that. Um, yeah. So, so uh, what, I'm, what other stories that, that uh, stick out in your mind? Like the guy that came in with the tie, could you tell us about that? The one of the tie, the, the, um, yeah, that was the uh, IRS agent. We, yeah. Igor always would, you know, you're supposed to pay your taxes, sign a check, send it in. Igor would never sign the check. He hated to pay. So he didn't sign the check, and so they're going to audit him now. And what week did they pick? Like, I think it was the week or two before Christmas. Now, in our shop, Igor always had, like, uh, there was a mesh screen and there'd be leather jackets hanging there, regular jackets. All the shoplifters would bring stuff in and, you know, he'd sell them and they'd get a piece of the pie. So, And then he'd have a showcase in there and he had all ties and cuff links, whatever the shoplifters would grab. So they're, they're in there auditing the shop. There's two guys, one sitting in the back, one sitting in the front. It was a good thing. It was a slow week. So they're auditing the place, <laughs> and uh, this Dan Gash was his name. He was an IRS agent, and he's up there on his little calculator, you know, hitting the numbers and stuff. And Boy, these are nice ties, he goes. Igor says, yeah, you want one? No, no, I don't want it. You can't accept it. The guy goes, I got to make a phone call. Igor says, yeah, we got a phone right in the back. It was a pay phone. I can't use your phone, he goes. And he leaves. He, next door, there was a girl called the Right Way Girl. So he goes and he makes his phone call. He comes back and, and boy, these are nice. Yeah, and he's looking at the ties. And I, That's a nice tie. Igor takes the tie out and he ties it around his neck real nice. And the guy goes, yeah, I like this tie. Igor says, you can have it. And now I got you, Igor goes. I got you. Like that. But the guy's like, oh, take the tie off the but anyhow, he ended up becoming my customer. I cut his hair for years. Dan wow. Was his name. Nice man. But I got a funny story for you about the job. A couple funny stories about Willie. W Willie Messina. Okay. Willie used to come there all the time. I think they called him the pint-sized terrorist or something. That was his nickname. He was, a ni he was nice. Willie was – I got along great with Willie. So he comes in one day and he's getting a shoe shine. And we had the shoe shine in there. His name was Tony Easter, big heavy set black guy. And he had glaucoma. He couldn't see real good. 
So in the newspaper, they were writing about Willie being a hit man and a, all of this other nonsense. So Tony asked him, he's shining Willie's shoes. He goes, Mr. Willie's, I got to ask you a question. Willie goes, yeah, what is it? And I'm standing by the shoe shine chair. Is it true you puts the people in the trunk? Like that, he says to Willie, I back up because I think Willie's going to beat him up. So Willie leans down close face to face with him, right? He goes, I don't put people in the trunk, Willie. I mean, Tony, they put themselves in the trunk like that. <laughs> and I was thinking Willie was going to kick him, punch him or something, but he didn't. Oh, my. God. Then another time, Igor cuts Willie's hair. And there used to be a standing joke. If you were a gangster or, or uh, uh, not, an, uh, not an elected, an appointed politician, Igor would cut your hair for free because he, oh, he loved that shit, right? Mm -hmm. So Willie's getting his hair cut by Igor. He leaves. He goes. He, wherever he went, I think he went by Robert Grizel clothing store. Someone said, Willie, your sideburns are crooked. What? Your sideburns crooked. Willie calls the shop. I answer the phone. At the house of Igor, he goes, say, listen, you, could I swear? Yeah. He goes, yeah. say, listen, you fat motherfucker. You cut my sideburns crooked, and I ought to slap you right in your face, you fucking faggot. And he's hollering and. Igor wasn't a faggot, but Willie's hollering like crazy. And I'm on the phone and I go, who did you want to speak to? He goes, this isn't this Igor. I go, no, this is, put that motherfucker on the phone. I, go, I covered a mouthpiece up on the phone. I go, Igor is for you. We had extensions. It was like he wrote it off a script. He goes, Say, listen, you mother, faggot motherfucker. You cut my cyber crooked. And look at it. I look ridiculous and this and that. And, and, and I want these sideburns straighten out. I'm coming back. We hang the phone up. So Mike Swidex in the shop. Mikey's a big jokester. <laughs> Man, I'm in trouble now. I'm in big trouble. What do you think's going to happen? Swidex goes, I could see it tonight. They're going to be sitting at the long table. JB will be at the head of the table. And he and JB's going to say we're ta they're talking about business. Is there any other order of business here? And Willie's going to stand up and point to his sideburn, and JB's going to go like this here, thumbs down, like that. It ain't really going to happen. It ain't really going to happen. But that's <laughs> busting Igor's balls. And Igor's like, don't joke like that. What do you think's going to happen? He goes, no, don't forget about it. Next year, when he comes in, he'll get another free haircut, and he'll forget all about it. So that's that was another story in the barber shop. Oh, wow! Not a laughs in that barber shop. So you were there. You were there with your brother when that fight happened. You want to tell us that story? Yeah, my my brother had a bar, Spanky's. It was in Schiller Park. So there was fights in there every week. It was like the fucking bucket of blood. So there was like four men, four doormen working all the time. So one day the kids from Melrose Park are going to fight with the kids from Grand Avenue. They're all fighting all the time with each other. Always Italian kids. Later on in life, they grow up to be friends. Meanwhile, my brother's bar is taking the brunt of all of so this fight starts as Louis the Mooch's kid. And he's f fighting and they're all fighting. And, and I grabbed the kid and I got him from the back and I'm pulling him back. And he's like, you know who my father is? He's the head of the crime syndicate. He's there all going to be sorry. You're going to be dead. And this and that. And I said, I bet your father would be real proud of you hollering that he's the head of the syndicate. I don't think he'd like that at all. So I'm pulling the kid back. He he kicks the fucking jukebox, cracks the glass, and, and I'm holding him. My brother's partner, Tino, slaps him in the face. So that now the fight would break the fight up. Someone 
has a blackjack. They hit the kid with a blackjack. He calls his father on the phone. He goes to the pay phone, calls his father. The owner just hit me with a blackjack. His father comes down there. I call him, and I know his father's coming. I call my brother. I said, Frank, you better come down there. He goes, do I have to? I go, yeah, Louis' kid got in a fight. Someone hit him with a blackjack. Tino slapped him, and he's called his father. His father's coming. There's all police all over the place. So his father comes, and he starts hollering. You motherfucker, you hit my brother. You hit my son. I go, holy Louis, my brother wasn't even here. He didn't hit your kid. He said, the owner hit the, my kid, and that's your brother. He owns the joint. See, Louis didn't like my brother because Louis used to have them taverns on the muscle. And when he came there, after my brother took over the tavern from Joe Pepitone, who was a Cub ball player, who used to pay, he come to collect, and my brother says, you know, I don't pay. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm with Tony. I don't pay. Well, he didn't have to pay. Well, Louie didn't like that because everybody paid. Louie didn't like that idea. So he still thinks my brother hit his kid, and he hates my brother anyhow because my brother wasn't paying. So the next day, my brother goes by Rocky to tell Rocky. Rocky had a beef stand in Morrow's Park. He was partners with Jack Cerrone. So my brother's in there. Who comes walking in? Louie. And Louis starts hollering, ah, you motherfucker. My brother, take it easy. So Louis, they start wrestling, fighting. My brother's got Louis against the, the cooler. And Rocky says, break it up. You know whose joint this is. Break, the fu break this fucking fight up. So my brother, all right. So Rocky, Rocky's a tough guy. Rocky breaks the fight up. My brother comes by the barber shop. He goes, well, I got a problem now. I go, what happened? He goes, well, I got in an argument with Louie, and I were wrestling, and I punched him, and Rocky broke the fight up. He's, I'm in big trouble. I know I'm in trouble. I go, well, Frank, you weren't even there. He goes, yeah, but now I hit Louie, and that's a no, no. And the phone rings at the shop. It's Carlos Sarlo. He's a boxer, a retired boxer, a nice man. Joe Lombardo's good friend. In fact, Joe was godfather to one of Carlos' kids, Carmi, who used to fight in there every fucking week. So my brother said, Carlos says, tell your brother to come down here. The old man wants to see him by Bert's Tavern. I go, okay. Frank, you got to go down there. I'm going to go with you. No, don't go. I don't want you to go. I says, you weren't even there. I'm going to go with you. I, I was... There, I seen the whole fucking thing. So we get in my car. I got a new Cadillac at the time. We're driving down there. My brother says, park a block away. Park a block away, why? You're driving a Cadillac. What's that got to do with it? He goes, you're driving a Cadillac. You can't afford one. They could afford new Cadillacs and they can't buy them. He said, they're jealous. They get jealous. We had park a block away. We go walking up. Joe is standing there with Louie, a couple other wise guys, and Jimmy Ganeel. Legs, they called him. Big, tall guy. Jewel teeth. So we walk up, and Joe goes, frisk him. So they frisk my brother. And frisk him, too. And Joe says, no, you don't have to frisk him. He's my barber. He, he won't have a gun. So we're standing there, and Joe goes, you know what that is, Frankie? Yeah, it's Louis the Mooch. You don't call him Louis the Mooch. You're going to call him Mr. Eberly. So my brother cocks his fucking head like this here, and he goes, Mr. Eberly. Just as he says that, Louis sucker punches him. So my brother bounces back against the fence. He charges Louis, hits him. They get on the ground. My brother's on top of them. Joe picks my brother up from the back like this. So my brother couldn't use his arms. Pulls him back. As he's getting up, Louie picks up a brick. 
he goes to hit my brother with the brick, but it, it don't make a good contact. And he hits him, but my brother's still fighting. And they're fighting again. My brother gets on top of him. And he gives him a couple more. Again, Joe pulls him off. This time, Louis grabs a Coke bottle. Hits my brother over the fucking head with the Coke bottle. My brother drives to all fours. And he just had major surgery. He went to scare. Had, uh, that's when they used to take the gallbladder out the old-fashioned way. And he kicks him in the stomach. And I'm crying. I'm going, this ain't fair. Beating my brother like, this ain't fair fight. And Ganil's like, Joey, if you get involved, you ain't going to, you are going to get beat up in the alley. This is good as it's going to get. I'm like, motherfucker, I'm crying. I, there's nothing I could do. Ganil's a big guy. He's holding me. Joe, uh, Louie kicks my brother in the stomach. My brother drops. So Joe tells Louie, now you can leave. So my, you got your evens, now leave, he tells Louie. So Louie leaves. Stand up. My brother gets up. Joe, I'll never take another fucking beating like this again. I didn't deserve this. I wasn't there. Joe's like, Frank, if the old man was in town, he was probably boat would have been dead. He says, just, you're lucky you just got a beating. And that's it. And this is the way I had it done, beating. Because when he's out of town, I say who lives and dies. What the fuck? Now wow. take this money. My brother's like, I don't want your fucking money. And I ain't taking a beating like this ever again. So we go to my brother's condo. Call Tony on the phone, he says. I call Tony. Tony's like, Joe, I know. I know what happened. I knew what was going to happen. That's as, that's as good as it could get. Take it like that. He says, put your brother on the phone. I go, it wasn't right. He goes, I know. It had to go down that way. I put my brother on the phone. He goes, Frankie, come out here. I want you to come out here. He says, I can't. I got a business. I can't come out there, he says. And I got things going there. He says, well, I'd like you out here with me. Hang the phone up. That was it. I go, Frank, how the fuck did that happen? I mean, you're you're like a wise guy. And he said, Joe, they weigh you. The guy that brings in the most money is the guy that gets the favor. Louis brings in 5000 a week from the pinball machines and shit. He gives them 5000 a week. Naturally, he's right. I go, oh, my God. Oh, that was, that, was, that was a terrible thing to see. Having your brother get beat up in front of you and be held. Oh, my God. It's fucking right. terrible. It's just like in the it's like in the, the movie Casino. I mean, it's damn, it's terrible. That's awful. Um, how, uh, your your brother, he um, he lent your mom a car once, oh. and he, uh, the floor mats. Yeah. Uh, what happened was they used to tag cars back then. All right, that was in the sixties. You know, my brother steals a car, a Thunderbird, a sixty-one Thunderbird. I can't think of what year it was, 64 or 5, maybe 60, maybe 66, I don't know. So he steals this Thunderbird. He paints it. He makes it look fucking like beautiful. Now, we're, we're living in Franklin Park at the time. I think he stole the car. I don't know if it was River Grove or Franklin Park, close by. But he painted it. It looked like a completely different car with the paint job. My mother says, Frankie, I got to go to uh, Zares. I think it was Zares. It was at Belmont and Cumberland. Move your car. He said, just take my car, ma. She's all right. Well, she takes his car. She goes there. She's shopping. She comes out. There's a guy standing by the car. He goes, it's my car, lady. There's her, what? Yeah, that's my car. Don't move. I called the police. They're coming. Get the hell out of my way, she goes. It's not your car. She gets in the car. I, I don't know if she said it's my son's car or what. I, I don't know what she said. So anyhow, she gets in the car. She, 
he knew it was the car because I think it was the floor mats in the car. I don't know if it was a bumper sticker or the floor. He did everything. He changed everything. But one thing he forgot, this kid noticed it. He goes, she comes home. You son of a bitch. You make your mother drive a hot car. What's the matter with you? He says, what are you talking about? She don't tell me. She goes, it was a hot car. The guy came up to me. Ah, I'm not in a hot car. Yeah, it was. He noticed everything. But you, well, you didn't change the floor mats or whatever it was. He was it was either the bumper or sticker. Or the so it, he had it. He was going out with this girl who he ended up marrying. Mary. She lived in the city on uh, Farragut, I think, up north. So the cop was Ernie Rizzo. He was on the case. And he goes there and he says, uh, I seen a comment once that a guy said maybe he knew my brother was in the other room and he wanted to come out. That could be true. So he goes there and he's telling her, uh, you got a Thunderbird registered here, sir? No. Yeah, you had a car registered here to this address. The kid took the license plate. She goes, no, my brother's hiding in the bedroom. She goes, uh, you're mistaken. I didn't have one here. Well, the title got mailed here. Who's got the title to this car? She says, I don't know what you're talking about. So I, I don't know. He ends up having a cup of coffee. Here, and he asked her out on a date. And my brother's in the other room, and he went, but he didn't come out of the room or he would have got arrested. But, yeah, that was another story, the Thunderbird story. Oh, my uh, God. Guys, if you're just coming into the room, be sure to hit the like button. Red, can you turn your volume down just a little bit? We're getting feedback from you. I've had to mute your mic here a couple times. It's a little too loud. Um, uh, this is Joe Collada, everybody. If you're just coming in, this is Frank's younger brother, and uh, everybody's been asking about the screenplay, Joe. What's happening with the screenplay? Can you it's tell us a little bit about really, that? It's coming along really, really good. Uh -huh. and, yeah, we're close. The, we got a Hollywood producer on it. And uh, see what happens is she looks at all of your – and I hate to give the goods away on the thing, but no one could steal the story anyhow. But she, she looked at all of your mob blogs. There's a lot of hours of it, a lot, a lot of hours. But you can't just go into a showrunner with all of these. They're not, they, don't, they don't have the patience to look at everything. So she condensed most of it down to three hours. Now she's condensing that down to 30 minutes, and then she's going to write a four-page introduction you bring it to a showrunner then they bring it to the studio and she's got connections to the studio and uh it's really good adam it's really good we're looking for different people uh to play you uh she, she, she's made suggestions i wanted to have you do it but she's made suggestions who's uh, the one that Vin vincent what's his name D uh, do you What's his uh, a deal free name? Private Pile from Full Metal Jacket. Private Pile, the Jelly Donut. Well, Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah. And, and, and either him or Vince Vaughn. But uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, I thought would have been, if she couldn't, if they w couldn't use you, uh, I said Vincent D'Onofrio because he's in the magic. And I'm hoping that there's a connection between you and him being that he like he does magic tricks, and you, you're a magician. You're one of the best. And I'm hoping that you know he would you'd have something in common when he talks to you. And then I also like his daughter. His daughter. I can't think of her name right now. She was on uh, Animal Kingdom. Uh -huh. His daughter, and she played the part of. Uh, the mother of the kids when they were little kids, not Ellen Barkin. I can't think of her name right now. She's married to Sean Penn. But anyhow, she's she's pretty. And I'd like her to be in there too because, I mean, father and daughter, but he could be you and she could be maybe one of Tony's girlfriends or one of my brother's wives or something because my brother was married three times. Yeah. So. 
So Ultra Cowboy said that Denzel Washington should play me. Now, yeah. if we go to a woke network, they might have to get Denzel to play. So, what <laughs> I know that I know you got you got. I know you have to put an African American in a script. I mean, that's nowadays, and that's no problem. My brother's lawyer was Eugene Pincham. Yeah, he was, he was a, a black man who was a uh, his lawyer for years, and then he became a, a judge, and then he became an appellate court judge. Eugene Pincham. Yeah. No, that. Uh... We're going to use him. And then my brother, after that deal, when he got called to Washington because of a listener, his lawyer there was black. So, I mean, we, you know, that Denzel is to me one of the finest actors. And, 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 and I know my brother on the, on the shorts made comments about Robert De Niro, <laughs> political things, but. In my mind, Robert De Niro, I mean, he is one of the best actors to me. I think he's a great actor. And the only thing is when you when you use your platform to talk about people, you lose half your audience. You know what I mean? That's the problem with it. That's the problem with the social media stuff. But I still think De Niro's a great actor. I mean, I think he, my brother just, my brother was the kind that didn't pull no punches, as you know, Adam. Yeah. When, he, when he had something on his mind, he said it, and he could be, he could be kind of tough. So, Joe, um, when you were working at Igor's, uh, were you there when the murder happened across the street in the bingo parlors parking no, lot? No, I wasn't there at that time. I already had my own shop in Norwich, but yeah, that shop was L. Brown owned that shop, along with uh, Dominic Cortina owned it, and. Uh, and uh, Joe Nagal and and uh, Donald Angelini, they were the owners of that, but it was under L. Brown's name. Uh -huh. L. Brown, that was, I used to cut his hair too, but but uh, that was his bingo parlor, L. Brown. Now, you had outfit guys that came in to get haircuts in and out. They all came there at one time. Johnny DeFranzo, uh, Joey Andriaki, uh, Willie. Jack didn't come there. Jack Cerrone didn't come there. Joe Gags didn't come there. I mean, I'm trying to think. A lot of burglars came there. We had a lot of, a lot of burglars. Uh, I'm not going to mention their names. A lot of outfit guys. They're all dead. Now you also had police come in there. Oh, a lot of police. We had them. They used to come there all the time. Uh -huh. We get along with them. You know, it was. Uh, it's like a neutral spot, but we had a lot of mustaches come there. Yeah, so Willie came there. Johnny DeFranzo came there. Uh, Joey A came there for a while. I'm trying to think. Tony came there. Joe Lumby came there. Wow. They, they all came there. There's there's stories about all of those guys. They all came there. Tony was a nice guy. Tony, Tony was a nice guy. We used to have this one kid come there. His name was uh, Tony Gack. And he wanted to be a gangster in the worst way. He was like 16 years old. He'd wear a black suit, black shirt, white tie, and a fedora. Carried a gun. Wanted to be a wise guy in the worst fucking way. And he'd see it, and they... We'd, we'd have a lot of kids come in there because they knew all the wise guys came there and they wanted to be around the wise guys. So this guy comes in there and this one guy used to come there all the time. He was His name was Carl. He was a grumpy guy, but a nice guy. Got along good with him. I'm not going to say his last name because I'm friends with his family to this day. So Carl is in there and Carl was always miserable. And he was... a wise guy and his uncle was a real heavyweight. So Carl comes walking in and this kid Gax getting a manicure. And we told him, when Carl comes in, tell him, hey fat ass, would you like to end up in a trunk? Busting his balls. So Carl comes walking in and he says, hey fat ass, would you like to end up in a trunk? 
Carl looks at him and goes, what'd you say, Junior? He goes, you heard me. So Carl walks by my room. He goes, let me borrow your scissors. I go, oh, no. I'm thinking this we're going to stab him or what. Carl walks over and he takes his tie and he cuts his tie off at the top like that. And Jack started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It was funny. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> oh, that guy. One time he's, uh, Igor's cutting Tony's hair. So he said, this is the perfect opportunity to fuck with Gak a little more. So me and my real good friend are, I'm not going to say his name. He's in my room because he's alive and he's kind of strong. So I said, we tell him, go in the room and tell Igor, listen, you, I'm going to be a wise guy and slap him. Now, he's got Tony in the chair. We said, when Tony sees that, he'll want to bring you under his wing. This kid believed anything we told him. So Igor's got Tony in the sink shampooing his hair. And Gak walks in there, and he slaps Igor. And so you hear the crack like that, but you don't, nothing that gets real quiet. <laughs> Tony's looking up at Igor. Igor picks Tony up from the chair. And Igor starts beating this kid up in the room, bouncing him off the wall and everything. <laughs> the kid had glasses. Now he comes back in my room and his glasses are all bent. And he goes, how did I do? We said, I think they're going to make you. Like, yeah. <laughs> it would have never happened. Oh, and my God. They never, talk, they never talk gangster nonsense in the barbershop. There was a guy on a channel. His name was uh, Maselli. I think his name was Maselli. Mm -hmm. Not one of them YouTube channels talking with somebody. I don't know if he was talking with the Seaforts. Talk about Chucky Maselli. Yeah, he was talking to somebody. It read, didn't he go to jail? Yeah, supposedly he went to jail. Yes. He did, right? Yes. Right? Yeah. So anyhow. He, he was talking. nothing but a con man. Yeah. He, he gets on the to YouTube, and he said Igor had his own territory, and he, you know, he was a wise guy. Igor was no wise guy. He was a hardworking man. He was a barber. He was a hardworking man. I got a funny story about him too. But this Maselli said that whenever the wise guys would come there, it was a staging area. That never happened. Those guys never taught. In fact. A lot of times when Joe Lumby would come in the shop, if someone else was there and I know they were connected, they acted like they didn't even know each other. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. I mean, like someone that wasn't his crew, even though he knew them, he wouldn't act like he knew them. They never wanted, they never wanted that connection. I mean, later on, but uh, I mean, Tony did come in, Joe, uh, Tony brought Joe to the shop the first thing, but uh, they otherwise they didn't act like they knew these other people. And there it was no staging area for wise guys. He made a statement about when that guy Fakarada got hit, they were going to meet him back Igor's barber shop. Never happened. Frankie Calabrese never came in that shop. His brother Nicky never came there. It was no staging area. No. So then Maselli, Maselli, go ahead, I'm Maselli sorry. said to me, you went to Igor's, didn't you? Just like I did. And I said, no, never heard of it. Yeah. He, he, I don't, he probably started coming there after I left. I left Igor's in 1980. I worked till there till I think August of night or July of 1980. And then I opened my own shop and Joe stayed by Igor after I moved over there, because that was like his headquarters. A lot of guys would come there and hang around just to be around them. And, I mean, you know, that's how it was. Yeah, so it, it, everything was on the down low with those guys when they talked and they were around each other. They didn't even act like they knew one another because their their association didn't even exist, right? That's how it's supposed yeah. to be. They didn't, they didn't talk about 
any gangster nonsense in the shop. Never, never. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, if I had Domina Cortina in the chair and, and Joe Lumby walked in, he wouldn't even say hello to him. And Dominic wouldn't say hello to him. Wow. You know, and he told me, here, pay for here. This is for his haircut. He would pay for his haircut, but he wouldn't say hello. You know what I mean? <laughs> they didn't want each other. To, you know, they paid homage to Joe. Joe was the guy. But uh, he didn't talk with them people about any nonsense or not. That didn't happen. All right, guys, if you're just coming in, this is Joe Collada. This is Frank Collada's younger brother. We're on here today asking him. He's a barber at Igor's Barbershop, uh, which, again, was located uh, where again, Joe? In Chicago on Belmont Avenue by Austin. There you go. And how long did you work there? 14 years. My brother got me the job. I was going to barber school, and uh, I, had, I had about four months in at barber school. And he says, you know, Joe, uh, Tony goes by uh, Igor, and Igor is looking for a barber. The kid's going to Vietnam. I said, well, I still got more time left in barber school. I won't. I got to do 11 months here. And he goes, well, they know the owner of the barber school, Sal. Sal Falzone was his name. And uh, Tony's brother, Vince, the older brother, grew up with Sal. I'll tell him to, you know, let you out early. Maybe you could go work there while you're still in school. And that's what happened. I got out in uh, April of 66, but I still had more time to go. So I used to go to barber school from 9 to 1230. And then I'd go by Igor about 2 o'clock and work till 630. And that's how I started there by Igor. A nice man, very nice man. And all these different guys came in and out that were connected, everything from from, from mobsters to police officers, politicians. We had, had uh, Lou Farina was the alderman. He was a creep. And uh, he was a creep, the guy. He used to cut his hair. <laughs> I can't even tell you what he used to talk about. The guy was, uh, he was a bushwhacker, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Some things need to stay confidential. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's some things need to, but uh, yeah. any 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 politicians? Yeah. I used to cut his hair when he was the ward superintendent. And then he became the alderman. We had state reps, we had uh a congressman, we had uh we had we had a lot of politicians. Uh, a lot of big, big shot coppers. They all came, everybody came by Igor's. Everybody wanted to come to that shop. It was, I'll tell you what, I never missed work. I'd go to work sick. It was just, it wasn't like work. It was fun every day. When we weren't busy, we'd be sitting, just shooting the breeze. It was a good place to work. That's nice. I got to tell you a funny story about Igor. It's really funny. Igor, Dan Walker was the governor at the time. Igor wanted to be uh, on the Barber Examining Board. And don't hate me, Igor, for telling this story. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I ever told you this story, Adam. So he wanted to get on the Barber Examining Board. So they said he had this guy coming by him who was uh, friends with his chief of staff. He said, 500 will get you on the barber examining board. Igor pays the 500. He gets on the barber examining board. So Igor says, all right, any, any grease balls want their license? Or anybody? Tell them it's 200. Oh, no, tell them it's 400. That's what it was. Tell them it's 400 and we'll split 200 apiece. I said, Okay. I didn't know anybody that was wanted their license. So he's on the board, and there's a Puerto Rican girl on the board. I can't remember her name. So he tells her the same thing. You get any Puerto Ricans or Mexicans that want their license, 400, and we'll split 200 apiece. If I get any, you know, grease balls, 200 apiece, we'll split 
four, we'll split to 400. She's like, okay. Some got mixed up. He, he flunked somebody that she took money from. Maybe he flunked a couple people that she took money from. So, <laughs> Oops. The phone rings one day at the barber shop. I answer the phone. They say, let me speak to Mr. Del Medico. I said, who's calling? This is Agent Flowers or whatever the guy's name is with the FBI. Hold on. I go, Igor, it's the FBI. Now, we had extensions and we had a pay phone in the back. You, you couldn't just dial out on our phones. They were all extensions with a pay phone. I said, Igor, it's Agent Flowers, whatever his name was, with the FBI. You're fucking with me? One of your friends? No. Gets on the phone. He says, uh, Mr. Delmonico, yeah, this is agent whatever. We got uh, whatever the Mexican lady's name was down there. She says you were you were on the board with her and that you were taking money, but you flunked people that she took money from. You should come down there and you should bring a lawyer. What would you say your name was? It's so-and-so. Who put you up to calling me? This is the FBI. Because everybody played pranks in that shop. Because everybody joked around. Remind me to tell you another story about a burglar. Okay. Well, he says, all right, give me your number. So the guy says, Hudson 327 on her, whatever the number was. Igor hangs up. Kalata, you better not be fucking around me having your... Igor called the guy. He gave you his number, called her. So he walks all the way to the back of the shop and he dials the number. The guy answers the phone. Agent Flowers, FBI. Now you hear a fart. The whole shop, you could hear the fart, and he's like 20 feet away. Loud fart. Igor shitting. And he says, We got Lopa, whatever her name is down here. You better get a lawyer and come down here. I want to talk to you. He goes, oh, my God. Now he's in the back of the shop, and he starts walking to the front of the shop. And every step he takes, he farts. Because he's a nervous fucking wreck. <laughs> you don't want to have trouble with the G. Then he's walking, and he's farting. And he gets in his room, and he goes, oh, man, what am I going to do? If Marie finds out, oh, my God, I'm in big trouble. What am I going to do? Jack Duff is in his chair. Jack Duff goes, Igor, they're not going to lock you up. He goes, what do you mean they're not going to lock? He says, you know, inmates have rights too. He says, you'd be in there shitting all over yourself. He says, I could see the headlines. Head of the Pasta Fazul gang arrested. He goes, we're taking bribes. He goes, no, he says, I'll get my lawyer, Frank Whalen. He'll go down there with you. I'll give him a case of Cuddy Sark. He'll take you down there and plead you guilty. So he ended up getting uh, work release at the MCC Center. That's when it was brand new. <laughs> cool. So he had to go down there, and he, he got a year work release program. Oh, that poor guy. And he couldn't drive. You had to take the bus back and forth. But he had this customer of his that would drive him back and forth. And you had to pay to be there. You had to give him 25% of your pay to be locked up. So that's that was a funny story. Oh, my God. Guys, hit the like button if you're just coming in here. Don't be a jag off. Smash the like hit button. The fucking like button, guys. That's right. You don't want the hammer thumbs. Yeah. Hey, Joe, what's the funny burglar about uh, that you said uh, you had a story about a funny burglar over there and uh, that used to come to the shop? Nice guy. A thief. A yeah, real nice guy, Steve Garcia. They ended up killing him because he robbed Tony Accardo's house, supposedly. supposedly. But he was a burglar and really a, really a nice guy. Real nice. I used to cut his hair. I grew up with him, in fact. So he was a burglar. So what do you think Michael does to him one day? Him and Jimmy Leonetti. Michael was 
Michael was bad. He got away with a lot of stuff because of his brother. He used that who his brother was Tony, you know, and people were afraid of him because of that. So he, Michael and Jimmy Leonetti, who was Michael's good friend at the time, they handcuffed Garcia to a, a delight pole out in front of the barber shop, and they pulled his pants down and they put a sign on him. I am a known burglar. And they left him there for two hours. That's the kind of jokes Michael used to pull on people. <laughs> now Jimmy Leonetti was Michael's good friend. Jimmy was robbing Louis de Mucha's machines. I forget year, what year it was, in the year, in the early seventies. So he's robbing Louis's machines. He, Jimmy had uh, one of the Mace locks, master locks, uh, keys, and he used to be able to open up the the uh, uh, pinball machines, and he would take the money out of them. So Michael tells Leonetti, Jimmy, you got to quit robbing their machines. They know it's you. You're going to get one warning. That's it. Leonetti, or they're, or they're going to plant you. Here's him. Fuck them. He says, I'm going to keep doing it. And he kept doing it, right? You know the outcome. So Leonetti tells me, could you imagine the nerve of that little asshole telling me they're going to kill me if I keep robbing that Jagoff's machines? Or you better not rob his machines no more if they told you that. This was long before the fight with my brother and Louis. As you better quit robbing his machines. He says, I told my mother, if I die, bear me on my, put me on my stomach in the casket so they can walk by and kiss my ass. I said, Jimmy, you better quit it. Well, he kept doing it. Lo and behold, he's in a grill on North Avenue, right, Leonetti? Two guys walk in. This is a stick up, everybody against the wall. He goes against the wall, they shoot him in the head. They didn't rob nobody. They shot him in the head, it was in Monroe's Park, and they walked out and they drove away like nothing. Wow. Um, before we well, before we started up today, you were telling a story to uh Red and I about uh Mark Thanosaurus. Oh, I never told you that one. We didn't get to that one. I told you. Oh, <laughs> we, did, we weren't live when you told it. So let's get to that one. Mark Tannosaurus was the captain of police or the commander in the 15th district. He comes in the shop one day. He had every tavern on the muscle. They pay him 200 a month. Every tavern had to pay him 200 a month. So he comes walking in one day with his George Demet and this other policeman. He's, my name is Mark Donosaurus. I'm the commander in this district. I pay for absolutely nothing, and I never wait when I get a haircut. You understand? Igor's like, yes, sir. So he would come in anytime he wanted on Saturdays, busy days, come in, get his haircut. He'd bring his kid. He'd bring his partners. They'd get haircuts. Igor did them. Igor never went on vacation, right? He's going to go to Disney World with his wife and children. Hardworking man. He goes to Disney World. He's out there for all week. He'd call every day. How's it going? How's it going? Great. We're busy. How much should we do today? I tell him. Saturday, Mark Tonosaurus walks in with George DeMet, and he goes, uh, now, now I'm crowded. It's just me and another barber working, and we're crowded. He says, I'm next. I go, no, I got people ahead of you. What? I says, I got people ahead of you. He says, maybe you don't understand. I don't wait. I said, I got paying customers here. I can't take you. He gets beat right. He turns around. He walks out. Fifteen minutes later, the phone rings. It's George DeMent. Oh, you made a big mistake. What mistake did I make? Tells me who he is. You didn't take the commander. He don't wait and he don't pay. He'll pull the license from that shop. 
he could close you down. I go, I don't care. I don't know the place. I'll go get a job somewhere else. We'll close the shop down. I was a punk kid, right? I don't care. The end of the day comes the phone rings. It's Saturday. Hey, buddy, how's it going? How's business? It's Igor. It's really busy. We had a real busy day. Only one problem. What was the problem? The commander came in and I wouldn't take him and he got mad and George Demet called up and he said he's going to close you down. Oh my God, how could you do that? Get the Rolodex out. You know the Rolodex where they got people's phone numbers? Get Jackie Duff's phone number. Have him, give me that number. I got to call him right away. He's got to call G, uh, G, uh, Kringus and uh, he's got to call Marzullo. Marzullo and Kringus were partners in the funeral home. And Johnny Kringus was the dinosaur suspense. You got to straighten this. He's got to straighten this out. That guy will close us. He's an animal. What's the matter with you? I says, ah, fuck. I mean, I had paying customers. You can't do that. So he calls Jack Duff. Jack Duff calls John, uh, calls Kringus, or calls um, uh, Marzullo. Marzullo calls Kringus, whatever. And I, it was supposed to be straightened out. So Igor comes home. He's home on Monday. Ding dong, his doorbell at home. Mark down the source, George Tibet. Get in the car. Let's go to your shop. They go to the shop with him. He says, What's this about? I thought this was straightened out. Open the shop. He goes in with him. They got flash paper. That's that paper you put in water, it disappears. They go in the shop. They run the water. They put the paper there. See how easy this is to close you, Igor? We'll say you're booking out of here. Don't ever, ever turn him down again. You understand? Okay. Meanwhile, there was a shakeup in the 15th district. Some tavern owner beefed on Tannosaurus. A bunch of tavern owners beefed on him. And he ended up going to jail. He went to jail. I don't know how much time he got, but I know he went to jail for shaking down the bars when he got out, they killed him. Someone shot him with a shotgun. Wow. That's true, true stories. These are all true stories. Yeah. yeah. I got a, que a, a question before we wrap this up. Nicholas Seifert wants to know, Joe, uh, just a two-part question. Do you think that Chucky Marcelli was as close to Joe Lombardo as he said? No. Second part, do you think he was there in the Danny Seifert <laughs> I, I can't comment on that. Okay, all right. So I could comment on this. I don't believe he was close to Lumbee. I don't think anybody's that close to Lumbee. I don't I don't believe anybody was they could say they were close. Those guys they don't have a lot of friends, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they got acquaintances. Do they trust anybody? No. I have a cousin. I had a, he's dead now. After my brother rolled, I had to go meet somebody who was a very close friend of mine, who was very well connected. And I had to go meet him after my brother rolled. And I said to my cousin, who was also connected, I said, I have to go meet so-and-so. Could I trust him? You know what his answer was? No. Does he breathe? <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust him. Unbelievable. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. All right. You. you want another story or you want to save him? We're going to save it, Joe. We're going to leave them wanting more. Today has been awesome. It's been amazing. And everybody, thanks for tuning in. This uh, th this was amazing having you on today, Joe. Would you come back and do this again? Do you think that you could maybe, you know, do no. this? It's like no. never going to happen? No, I'm not coming back. You got a taste of me and that. No, I'll be back. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's been awesome. Have a great day, everybody. Red God bless. Joe, thank you so much. Hit the like button, guys. Please hit that like button. Hit the like button. Have a great day. It's been fun. My blog.